Welcome everybody back to KC Happy Hour here, episode number, I believe this is 62, if I'm not mistaken, Aaron, am I wrong? I think we're 62, 62. right? Yeah. yeah, so we are back, and uh, as we'll let everybody slowly get on in here tonight, uh, we've got a loaded show, we have a huge cast and crew joining us as the show will go on. Colin Warren, uh, Brandon Jarscrack, Paulie Massimino, Ryan Cassidy, all were competing this weekend at CKNA Grands. We'll have them join us. Braden Eves and yourself were there working on the wrenches in the data. Uh, they were there, so they'll have uh, some intel for us as well. I was not. I was at home, got to watch the broadcast a little bit. And at the end of this first segment, I wanted to uh, kind of give everybody a little bit of an idea of what kind of a broadcast production looks like. Uh, first of all, we got... Uh, a lot of people asking all year long and even through the weekend if we were going to be there. And I appreciate all the cheerleading, everybody. It means a lot. Uh, it's cool that we have that kind of an impact that, you know, we get asked to go everywhere. And uh, as much as I'd like to go everywhere, it's it's tricky. But it's um, it's expensive to put on a broadcast with the way that carding is right now. And again, we'll get to that in a little bit, but I hope to shed a little bit of light on that here in the first segment. And then when we add everybody in here, when segments two and three come up uh, with all that big list of drivers, Colin, Ryan, Paulie, Braden, and Brandon, if you have any questions for the drivers from those events uh, and, and everything that's transpired, send them in the comments here below on YouTube. We will ob obviously also live on Facebook. You can put Q and a sections in here. We'll hit those at the end of the show probably closer to the top of the hour around 9 p.m. Eastern and uh, 6 p.m. Central. But let's go ahead and let's dive into everything uh, that we had because, again, there was there's a lot to cover beyond the CKNA Grands. Uh, there was the Tillis and T4 Nations Cup this weekend as well, so uh, another major four-cycle event uh, for really what's kind of the alternate uh, engine in the U.S., and there were a number of drivers that went over there. Aaron, you got a whole list of stats of where they all placed. Why don't you walk us through that, man? Yeah, so we ended up with four drivers in the Tillotson T4 senior category. Tyler McIntyre ended up with a really strong P2. Ian Quinn got P4, and then Ben Lida, Hunter Perry, P9, and P10, respectively. That was a really strong result for everybody out there. Um, and then we had, actually had three in junior that I didn't know about. Truly Adams, um, uh, Troy Adams' child, actually won in junior. Chase Biscaglia took P4, and Matteo Alfano was P26. Looks like they had a couple issues in the in the weekend. And then Phil, Pig Phil Pignataro was out there. He was about P uh, top 10 pace or so. I think he rolled off like P7, had a couple issues in the final, and uh, didn't make it, so he ended up P20. But he was he was looking pretty strong out there, too, in the senior 165 class, which I'm guessing is close to like a heavy class, if I had to guess 165 kilograms, if I, if I had to take a shot in the dark at it. Yeah, a little bit more. Piggy, Piggy was causing issues overseas, as he always is, Mr. <laughs> Phil Vignataro. We love Phil. Phil, shout out to him, of course, uh, from uh, where we're at here in the studio and back over stateside as all those people hopefully get home safe. Um, we uh, – did also have a number of races we were starting to get ready for uh, this week. As many of you know, we're streaming the finale for the Stars Championship Series coming up at the Motorsports Country Club of Cincinnati. Uh, so that's the season finale for that championship. Uh, that'll actually be, for those of you that want to tune in, a pretty cool broadcast because A.J. Myers is in the field, Andrew Pajoso is in the shifter field, so the Pro Stars field should be around 15 to 20 deep looking at the entry list. I think there was at least... 16 when i checked it uh thanks to our friends at the star series uh not long ago the k classes look really big it's going to be a little chilly over there it was a little chilly for the ckna grands and then of course newcastle as always super busy the rotax us finals are going on at newcastle motorsports park this week uh so that'll be a big show um as well and then the ikf grand nationals out of the west coast uh, are set for this weekend also uh, a shout out to Cole Nelson and the uh, Invader Gang because they have been doing an awesome job promoting that with everything they can over in Reno, Nevada, which hasn't hosted IKF Crans in a while. So there's a lot of different uh, events going on across the country here this weekend. So we'll have a lot to kind of uh, talk, talk about and touch on when we come back after the end uh, of the week. And then when it goes to track news, we haven't really touched on some of the tracks that we've been getting so excited about Um you know, over uh, the last few months that are getting a lot of renovations. So we'll kind of go through them one by one as we got Anderson race park. First of all, thankfully, uh, not too messed up. All good on the racetrack. They were, uh, it's on the West coast of Florida near Tampa. Uh, just got a full repave. Uh, they were, you know, had some barriers pushed around and some flooding, uh, from hurricane Ian, but no damages on the property from what they were posted about, which is cool to see. They got the paving done. They've actually had carts on the racetrack. They got supermoto stuff. One cool thing I wanted to mention that I didn't know they were doing, but we saw this a little while ago and forgot to touch on it. They added another little cut through they have down at the bottom left corner, right before that ha final hairpin, which 
will be a, a cool addition for the club racers. It'll finally make that last corner a little bit more of a breaking zone going in because that'll be like a flat-out kink going into the final turn. So um, cool racetrack down for Florida. Solid club that's continuing to grow. Uh, another note that they've you know done, it's not just the paving that they've done at the racetrack, but uh, at least on the racetrack itself. Uh, next to that lake at the top, uh, they've paved what you can see in the picture. A lot of parking that used to be really muddy kind of lagoon type, almost like swampy grass that couldn't really hold trailers and stuff onto. They've paved that, added a bunch of parking there. Um, the Florida State races are only pretty good when we go to this racetrack. So cool update on their progress. Um, Dallas Karting Complex has been, uh, you know, a big story in Texas uh, where we're based out of. Um, they are uh, pretty much, as you can see, just about done with paving on the first half of the two track layout that they're doing. Um, so you can see there the fully black asphalt, that's the brand new layout. They had been working on it, working on it, getting the paving done. So it looks like the paving's done. You can see remnants of the old racetrack. That's how they're operating right now with rental carts, with club races and with league racing. And then as soon as they're ready to move everybody onto the first of the two new layouts, then that side of the facility will get brand new pavement and a whole new reconfiguration as well. And then when it comes to having major U S races at the racetrack, you can connect the two layouts into a super mile, but this way for them, from a club race, racing perspective club racing and owner car practice days can kind of get back underway because they'll be able to have the rental carts on one side and the owner carts on another just like at the speed sports track in houston and just like at homestead with the rental car track they have there so um that's cool to see also because it's always tricky for racetracks like we talk about with the business model a little bit to justify having us cart owners there and uh another track that's a wor worthy talking point on that topic as well as a track getting added to the states is the k1 circuit um I actually talked to uh, our, our friends over at Scusa about this. And so right when Cal Speed was closing and even before that, you know, there was a lot of excitement about this brand new racetrack that they were going to build over in Southern California um, and that, uh, you know, they were we were hoping we were going to get owner kart racing there, obviously with Rocky Moran involved. That's a legendary name on the West Coast and in North American karting behind Moran Raceway. He's done a great job designing the racetrack and the uh, the, the main, him and the rest of the owners and investors on the project. Uh, Scoos invited them out to Supernats 24, and they were so amped up seeing top-level kart racing up close that it really uh, pushed them to to want to make sure that they'd have enough paddock space to host all kinds of club racing, owner practices, and of course, you know, national level events and international level events. So it's being built to CIK standards. We knew that. You've seen a lot of the, the track development because K1 has an awesome social media presence. Uh, but I was in the dark, obviously. I haven't been out to the West Coast, haven't been to California this year. So I, I wasn't really sure in touch of where all that stood. But from what it sounds like, it's still very, very promising for our, our race friends over in Southern California. So that's awesome to hear. And those guys are making good progress. And that track is still pretty much on track for um, you know being open. Uh, I think they were hoping for a soft open later this year. But at minimum, it'll be ready to go when we hit the ground running in 2023, which is super, super cool. Uh, they got garages, obviously. They're probably going to need to get a whole lot more for that market. If, uh, if they want to make the money, I think they could get a lot more garages than what they built uh, so hopefully they do uh, but that's great news for again for the, the socal market um out there and so that's kind of your updates that we had of uh, all the tracks is, is we will keep kind of checking on in on them again anderson race parks back up and running uh, i believe they're back after hurricane ian now um and dkc is getting closer and closer and closer to having that first of the two layouts together in k1 same thing paving's done they've already done testing on the racetrack they're just getting the rest of the facility ready to go uh to have to have racing out there which is which is cool and so now with all that out of the way like i said we had a lot of love and a lot of people wanting to ask you know about us doing the broadcast for cKNA and 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 uh, before you know, we go into any of that, first of all, like I said, they, I think the guys did a good job with the broadcast that was there. Um, I, I mentioned last week, I thought it was cool that there's more than just us interested and even kind of dabbling in uh, doing streaming because this is a motorsports streaming company. This is the company that did the F4 and the F3 US streams, and they do a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, I mean, their production name says, I think it's like Live Motorsports Media Production so or Media Group. Um, so that's cool because I think in the years past, I think they had like a sports broadcasting group come and do it um but yeah, i wanted I think, to break yeah no, go ahead i think years previous from what i can think at least from ck3 when i ran it up until last year it was like a baseball broadcasting group that they'd bring yeah. out and they did a decent job actually they, did, they didn't do bad in it um 
I actually, I actually like the broadcast that they have, but yeah, it wasn't a motorsport specific group or anything that they had coming out to do the broadcast and stuff like that. So it's cool to see if there's other, like I said, cool to see if there's other motorsports broadcasting groups that are taking interest in karting now and taking the workload off of you a little bit traveling every weekend. Yeah, I mean, so the big thing to understand for everybody when it comes to doing streams, right, is that, um, you know, for us, it's, um, it, it, we kind of like to do the whole package because I, I want to do stuff when we go and stream races at a high level, and I want to make sure that we're getting every bit of value out of it. I think looking back, streaming isn't a new thing, and, and going and doing live broadcasts for karting, karting's been on TV before, karting's had plenty of different karting-specific companies that have done live streams and videos. I was looking back earlier this week at some of the videos from the Stars, Snap-on Stars of Karting series, from CKI, from you know even old of videos. Um, you know, it's It's not new. Um, but understanding why those companies haven't hung around or why we haven't been able to capitalize on really good coverage in the past. Um, I didn't want to slip into that uh, same spectrum with KC. So, you know, when we go to an event, I want to make sure that, you know, we've got a, a good level, a good pulse and control on um, the, the commentary side. So typically we'll work with the announcer of the event. If the event wants to provide an announcer, sometimes they'll provide two. Uh, most of the time, it's usually us providing our own. Um, and we like to, at the big level events too, you know, like uh, Stars, uh, USPKS, SCUSA, and the Rock races we've gone to, bring in pit reporters as well. So all of that, obviously, the labor is, is really a big key factor uh, in the cost. And then you look at the value, right? You have it, the any minute viewership, which is uh, what's called when you tune into the broadcast and you see... Um, you know, the number of people watching at that second. That doesn't mean that only that number of people tuned in at that uh, to the broadcast the entire day. It's just at that specific moment in time, you have 150 and 200, which is about the numbers that I saw on CKNA. We've had sometimes as much as in the 300s into the 400s. Um, and then there's some smaller events where you end up down in the double digits and you're just hoping to get up to 100, right? And carding events, it's tough because... Uh, we want to show every class. We want to be equal and loving to everybody. And so the format of the day isn't great for getting outside spectators. And we've had plenty of debates on this show of going over, um, you know, whether or not that's even a, something that's in the cards for kart racing. Uh, so all that kind of circling back means that when you look at the, the cost for a series to put on a broadcast, what's their return on investment, right? Is it a long-term play to hopefully really get some outside numbers and eventually some outside sponsorship revenue where it can be a profitable deal for them? Or is it just kind of a give back to the racers, which up until this point has really been the only focal point, I think, for a lot of series when they look at doing them. And I think it still is right now, although, I, again, with us and our mission, I like to believe that we can be more than that and be a nice added benefit for uh, the guys in the series. To show you guys what I was able to kind of get a, just, uh, a gist of it from tuning in, it looked to me like they had two cameras that they were mainly operating. This was an angle that they had earlier in the weekend. Um, I don't know if they end. I, I looked through a lot of the broadcasts. It didn't look like this ended up being an angle that they actually shot the racetrack from. Might have been from the top of the grandstands if the grandstands are still there at the top of the grid, but just kind of look down the grid as a fixed shot. And then what they've done as uh, we go through, this shot is obviously from the side of the hill. So let's count this as camera number one. This was a man shot with a zoom and everything and probably wired in. I imagine they worked out of the Speedway Suites, which is where we like to work out of when we go to Newcastle down at the end of the front stretch by turn number one. So you have camera one here, assuming that's a camera guy manned. And again, pay rates could vary, right? But at least for us, I don't like going any bit lower than 200 a day when we hire people for any reason or for anything to do. And then on up from there, just like with tuner rates. So uh, assuming that it's 200 a day plus you know, meals, plus travel, uh, plus hotel. Uh, and that means they need to be at least in by Friday night, not knowing if these guys did a lot of testing or dark broadcasting of what you call it on Friday. We know we did the two, two days of streaming. So you have $400 in labor, maybe a hundred dollars more in meals, probably about $200 more in hotel. Um, all in all for about a thousand dollars for that one shot. Then they had a low shot down at the end of the front straightaway here. So that was camera number two. Uh, so assuming they had two camera guys, double it up to $2,000 right there. And this is not including the equipment because I don't fully under know what they have, but assuming that they own everything. And then, um, you know, unlike last year where they had Dave McIntyre and Randy Kugler, which I, uh, were brought in by the series, 
Dave McIntyre was there doing his thing on the PA, but these guys were doing their own private commentary on the live stream with Jordan Missig, who's on the road to Indy, as many know, um, and then Jeremy Scott. So you have two other announcers there. So now, now your crew's going up from two to four. And again, we're just estimating bare minimum, right, at about a thousand bucks a person to be there, more or less, maybe a little bit more if they flew, right? Flights are really expensive right now. So put it at maybe $4,500. And then that's not including the back end side. So with the back end on a broadcast, when you go to like a TV level, you know, obviously they've got a whole team of like sometimes five to 10 people just working on camera switching, graphics and directing. For us, when we normally go, I, and uh, this will be a little bit different as we grow, hopefully, um, but we run with one guy kind of on this on the switchboard on the laptop, controlling the camera, uh, camera switching, controlling the graphics, um, you know, trying to see if we can get to instant replay. But really, if you want to have an instant replay, it's kind of something you need to have another guy there for so he can go back and search during the broadcast versus uh, looking while it's live because then you're going to miss stuff while you're live or not switch the camera enough. And then you go uh, have a producer so a, or a director. So that's the guy that's telling the camera guys what to shoot to, kind of, you know, control on the back end. Maybe he's floating. You know, he's also kind of our floating technician. If anything goes wrong, he's on a radio earpiece with the announcers. He's on one with the camera guys. He's on one with the guy sitting right next to him working the laptop to uh, control the switching. And, and that's just from our perspective. So at minimum right here, not including any pit reporter or Dave Mack down on the grid uh, and not including any any more background than what we've done. Um, that's normally at least a six man operation with, you know, with, with travel, you know, with labor. And typically it takes a day or two to run all those cables, set up all that stuff and, and not including the equipment. That's five, six, maybe seven thousand dollars to put that on. And that's before, again, you factor in, you know, adding equipment. Uh, or even making a profit, right? That's just paying your people. That's not making a company profit. So I don't know the back end of this deal. Um, obviously, they were able to do the broadcast for free. I have to imagine that the deal made sense for both CKNA, where it wasn't too expensive, uh, and that it made sense for the the, med the motorsports media group, where those guys are making at least a little bit of money on top of just paying their people and getting themselves out there. Um, and you can, you know, you could stick two people in the same hotel room together. That's pretty commonplace in racing. But you know, overall. Um, I, I hope that everyone understands that, you know, even at the level that, that this broadcast was at or at some of our other smaller broadcasts or even the bigger ones we do, we're up to sometimes as much as a 10 man team. And that could be 10 grand or more that you spend in a single weekend. And what's 10 grand worth for only a couple thousand views and maybe only a couple hundred to maybe a thousand or 2000 unique viewers. So that stuff's important to. Um, you know, I, I think out perspective, I, I didn't really consider it. And so this is the first time for uh, us since we've done a broadcast that we go to an event and that there's been another one and that I can hopefully add a little bit of background and, and maybe it just adds, you know, just some knowledge for the people that watch at home that, you know, before you go and you tear down anyone that does any kind of streaming for, you know, racing in general, but especially for karting, understanding that it could be as much as a five figure bill, the series is paying or five figure bill that the broadcast company is weighing on. And right now, it's not like there's a whole lot of return. The Rock of Vodka guys, obviously, they've got the tent there for them, but they're the entire sponsor for the whole event. So, you know, when they're looking at maybe trimming fat or trimming costs, what's the benefit versus loss of having a stream outside of the fact that maybe a competing event has a stream and you don't? You know, does it add a whole lot to your event? Does it add entries? Does it take away pit passes, which is a common fear as well? All that stuff, again, just to say it's tough, it's expensive. But I thought it'd be a cool talking point to have on the show here tonight to give a little bit more background on that because that's something that, again, not everybody gets to see. Uh, I'm hoping we can do a little bit more behind-the-scenes content and show you guys a little more of what it looks like uh, putting a whole weekend together. At least that's been my goal. I always forget when we get too busy to vlog it all, but uh, it's something I'd like to be doing really, really soon. So hopefully... That all makes sense to everybody. And with all that said, that'll wrap up our opening segment here. We're going to bring in the rest of our drivers when we come back over the break and talk everything from the event. Lots of storylines and notables coming out of CKNA Grands. Um, and uh, again, we'll get to touch on all that when we get back from the break, guys. So thanks so much for tuning in so far. We'll see you right after this. The line has steadily made progress since its inception in October 2021. On top of servicing the Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana areas with products from comp cart chassis, Tillotson carts and engines, Miami, Briggs, Honda, and more. They're now promoting race events as well throughout the mid and coastal south region at NOLA Motorsports Park and finish line performance karting in Biloxi, Mississippi. 
Races are already set for the fall of 2022. September 3rd, October 22nd, and November 12th at NOLA Motorsports Park, and two dates, September 10th and October 15th at Finish Line Performance Karting. Driver Line is set to finish this year strong. Casey Appiar is presented by Precision Performance Karting. PPK is the exclusive South Florida distributor for the American-made Coyote Zenith Kart Racing chassis. PPK is offering trackside support at all the Cup Kart South Division events, the CKNA majors, including the Spring Nats and the Grand Nats, the Sunshine State Karting Challenge, and a number of club events in the Southeast. New here for 2022 and in partnership with Brandon Jars Crack Racing, PPK is also offering full arrive and drive opportunities in the Junior Senior Briggs 206 classes at the popular Stars Championship Series and the GoPro Motorplex Karting Challenge events. The same professionally prepared kart and motor package has propelled Brandon to victories at Winter Nationals and the Monticello Divisional in 2022 are available to you. In addition to the Coyote line of racing chassis, Precision Performance Karting is also a distributor for Odenthal Racing Products, Hilliard Clutches, Vega Tires, and Greyhound Racing Seats. Check out Precision Performance Karting on Facebook and Instagram or email them at ppkartingfl at gmail.com. From four-stroke to 100cc to 125cc and beyond, Techno Kart USA has a winning option for you. Based out of the Plains, Illinois, Techno Kart USA offers both chassis designed to win in all divisions of North American karting and a top-level race support program at the U.S. Pro Kart Series, Route 66 Sprint Series, select Cup Karts North America races, and both the Rock Vegas and Scusa Super Nationals. Podiums, wins, and championships are waiting for you whenever you're ready to get on a Techno Kart. For more information, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash technokartusa. All right, welcome everybody back. So let's go ahead and dive into everything that we've got coming out of this weekend here and bring in our drivers and panel onto the show. Uh, Brandon Jarsakrak is back, and he was actually driving this weekend. He's not that old. Yeah, um, for once. <laughs> for once, uh, Mr. <laughs> Businessman. Pauly Massimino was driving. Pauly, where are you actually, bro? <laughs> you normally have a cool setup, but it, it doesn't look that cool this week. Uh, I, had to, I had to throw something together real quick. It was either going to be in a, in a bed or I rigged this up, so I decided to go with this. We got a big panel here. Colin Warren joins the show again. Colin, good to see you here, buddy. Sorry. Right, good. Good you're me. good. Good to, <laughs> good to have you. Ryan Cassidy, first time on the show, man. Add a, uh, a little bit of youth to our show, Ryan. We appreciate you on here. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Braden Neves was on the wrenches here this week. So big panel. It's been a little while since we've had such a panel this size uh, on the show. Um, with all that said, everyone that watched the broadcast uh, or watched the race monitor kind of got uh, a gist of where you guys all ended up through the weekend. So, you know, we had a few talking points coming out of it that I think were, you know, interesting. Brandon, you and I will start off with you, right? We talked about it. Uh, the qualifying groups was a little bit tricky because of how big they were. And you had some thoughts on maybe uh, tweaking the format a little. And, and can you explain why some of the issues it was? Yeah, I mean, they, they did uh, qualifying based off of what we call happy hour, which is the last practice session. And <clears throat> they tried to space everyone out pretty evenly, which I think they did pretty good for like the first five, maybe six guys. And then the, the, uh, there were so many carts on track that they had to just start sending everyone out almost all together. And you could see like towards the back of the pack that most of the people were getting drafts and they said in the driver's meeting, you're not allowed to bump draft, but you can get a draft. So it, and at Newcastle, everyone knows if you get a draft, it's a very big advantage. So we saw a lot of people, um, not towards the back, but towards the, the back half of the field, um, in the practice times, they wound up at the front of the field for qualifying because you got such a good, uh, a lap from following somebody. And it kind of, that sets the whole tone for the whole weekend. And like me and Paulie both kind of struggled with it. We were top three, top five in both practices for light and medium. And then all of a sudden we qualified like 15th in, in the twenties. So like it, it definitely made it more of a struggle for, uh, for the rest of the weekend. But I think uh, the only solution is just make more sessions for qualifying, like split it into four groups instead of two. So then you only have 20 carts on the track at a time instead of 40, but there's no perfect solution to it, but I definitely think it's something that needs to be looked at. Was there was there a lot of gamesmanship and like you know what we are used to seeing sometimes when the quality open setups get uh, open sessions get pretty bad, a guy's dropping back or brake checking in the early laps? No, not really. You didn't really see any of that because I think I don't really remember, but I think they said in the drivers meeting you weren't allowed to wait up for anybody. 
So you kind of had to just go out and do your laps and they gave you four laps, which one, I think that's too many for a 206. You only really need probably two laps to do it. And that would kind of solve the time issue. If we just did like two or three laps and did half the amount of people on the track, it would make it a lot better. But there wasn't really anyone playing any games because they were very strict that if you did bump draft with somebody, the guy you bump drafted with and you lost your fastest lap. And I think they even took your second fastest lap away. They yeah, two. they took two. They took your two fastest laps away. So, gotcha. There was a lot of people trying to not do that, which was a good thing. Interesting. So I'll, I'll take you off here, but Colin, you're 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 a wily veteran as well when it comes to senior classes. Did you uh, did you try and act like you had a little motor issue and then figure it back out to give yourself a gap, or did you play by the rules too? No, I was trying to catch the person in front of me as hard as I could, <laughs> but they start. They actually got a little bit of a draft. I mean, I like Brandon was uh, top five in all the practice sessions and I ended up qualifying 15th and 10th. So it just, I didn't get a draft in either of my laps. It was just kind of unfortunate. Like yeah. you said that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like it, it, it just seems that, you know, what, uh, even, even for a track as big as that one, right? Like at least a Newcastle with the way the timing uh, loops at, you know, with how late in the lap it is like that first lap out's a pretty good out lap. So do you agree, especially with the tires there that you could get it done in just two? and cut the sessions down a little that way you don't add too much time yeah i think i think that would work um i also was thinking about the same thing as brandon as like four four qualifying sessions would be good or just send us all out there and let us do our thing i mean just do like a five ten minute session and free for all what about you ryan what what, what would you like if any tweaks for qualifying did you get hit by any of that stuff as well well in the, in the legends i was on the flip side of it so i was in the front and, you know, the guys behind me were able to, to close the gap a little bit. And, and then the same thing in the Masters. I was actually able to catch a guy past him, and then he was able to stay behind me and then, and then pick up his lap time. So, yeah, I think splitting into, you know, three groups, four groups, or even, as Brandon mentioned, you know, shortening into two laps, I think you get it done in just a couple laps. It's definitely a lot easier to manage when you do the shorter laps, right, to try and keep those gaps where people don't get a toe off Absolutely. them. You know, I mean, when you when you have it where there's that many laps, eventually, like it's going to happen, like what you said, where you're going to catch somebody, you know, and you're going to have to decide to pass them or not or, or you know, kind of burn the lap behind them or, or set your own gaps. So if you're trying to set gaps where you take toe out of it, the, the lower lap sessions, it seems like do uh, do a little bit better. But, you know, again, having that many on is, is tricky. And then moving into the racing, this has always been a hot topic with, uh, you know, especially it seems like at. I don't want to say strictly at CKNA, right? But like when you have the lower horsepower classes, it's that much easier to fight a pass on the outside and and keep the guy pinned down and crowd him a little bit. And CKNA South, I know for sure a lot of the WK Gold Cup races, a lot of four stroke racing that you don't like the uh, not every driver, it seems like, likes the unspoken rule that we have a lot more we'll see at the higher horsepower races where if you see someone going to pass you on the inside, you can hang on the outside at your own risk of potentially getting pushed off. You aren't owed that space as soon as they get far enough inside. So, Ryan, do you first – where do you stand on the on the racecraft rule there? And I, we'll kind of go around the horn on that of whether or not, you know, you're for leaving the space if, if they fully got alongside you. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, so I'm a little bit more old school. If a guy's even with me, I'll pretty much give him the turn and then try to try to get back by unless it's a – unless it's a turn you could – you know, comfortably hold it and, and know you're not going to go off. But um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think if if a driver has the pass, you should let him go. That's my opinion. Colin, uh, we'll go to you next here. What do you, what do you feel on that when it comes to racecraft? Because that's always it seems like a, a hot topic. Yeah, I agree with Ryan. I mean, if it's me, if someone's passing me, if they get more than halfway alongside me, I'm yeah. just going to give up the corner. It's not worth getting pushed off track on the outside. I mean. These races in 206 seem to be so long that you can get you can make this spot back up in next corner even sometimes. Like it's not worth ruining your whole race for it. Brandon? Yeah, I kind of agree with both of them. I uh I personally was always taught that uh when someone gets alongside of you and they pretty much match you wheel to wheel, um, you kind of just gotta give the corner up or else you're probably gonna get put off the track. Yeah. And uh so that's kind of the same motto I live by when I'm racing. And um, I mean, a lot of people this weekend, they definitely stayed on the outside, but um, it seemed like they were, at least for some cases, they were a little more lenient about 
um, allowing that like kind of contact go if you got all the way alongside and they were actually penalizing if you would just kind of go in and just hit them in the rear tire and turn them off, um, which was a good thing. But uh, yeah, I think there's nothing you can really do about it besides, honestly, I don't know how you could fix it besides trying to teach people um, the right way to just give up the corner so you can battle back again instead of getting pushed off the track and then you wind up going back even farther than if you just gave up that one spot. Paulie? Yeah, so uh, me personally, I I was always taught not to be on the outside. Nothing ever ever good comes from the outside. And uh, I know if somebody's on my outside, my, my goal is to put them off to uh <laughs> for pretty much for them to for pretty much them to learn unless unless i like them a little bit then i'll i'll give them a little exception but usually um usually if they hang around the outside they usually go off the track but uh yeah a lot of a lot of people seem like they were doing it this weekend i'm not gonna lie i did it a few times because i said you know what why not if i crash you know it's my fault i'll take responsibility but uh yeah, I mean, a lot of people in the LO206, they like to, to hold the outside, which is fine. But when they come in the pit screaming at you that you put them off, it, it's really nothing you can do about it. Braden? Um, I don't know. I think it's uh, I think it's it's tricky when, um, when you're in such a low horsepower category because a lot of the time, like, it's just there's not – really any braking and it's just like light lifts into the corner so it makes it really hard to actually like full commit get a, get fully alongside <clears throat> so then you're going to always have people that if they're going to want a position they're just going to have to send it and get it as long up i mean they mean they, they, they might be full throttle all the way to the apex and only get halfway alongside and at that point i mean I'm a big believer in just, you know, if somebody commits to the pass and gets alongside, you just slot in. I mean, it's go-karting. You slot in, get right back in, and you can pass the next corner. So um, I don't I don't know. Um, I don't really think that they should be giving penalties. I think that's kind of a self-regulated thing, whereas if you get, if you get pushed off three, four times from ha- holding the outside, you probably won't do it again, you know? And, and I'm glad you guys all kind of seem to be roughly on the same page, right? And Ryan, I think, like you said, you know, maybe a little bit more old school in the idea of, of not fully for it, right? But uh, mostly, if the guy's there, you're just going to let him go because you can get him right back. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, it's overlooked sometimes that how we race in carts and how passes are made is different than short track oval racing. And it's different than even car road course racing, right? Our passes are pretty darty and done in usually from, you know, right as the braking zone hits into the corner, into the center outside of the drafting passes. So, you know, understanding that that's going to naturally go a little bit different. And, you know, from a race director's perspective, you can only, like Brandon said, teach and force like so much, you know, if every driver like we just had here on our panel go all the way through and say, look, like, you know, we're fine with this. We're not fine with that. And you try to push against the wave almost. You're going to kind of, you know, hit a point where it seemed like they did this weekend um, and be like, ah, like you're going to race how you're going to race. I got to catch the outliers. But, you know, one cop car is not going to get 100 cars speeding. So if everybody wants to race a certain way, and it sounds like everybody does, that's the one thing that, um, you know, when you say it in the driver's meeting, you seem like you're an outlier um, as the race director, because I've said it before where I've gone like, you know, Colin, you've heard me at some of the SSKC races. I feel like I've lectured it a lot. And like, we go to those and can you, you could back me up here, right? We'll go to the, I'll say it and then be like, hey guys, like, look. Guy gets halfway up, he gets inside you, he's going to have the corner, like, give it up, go to the next turn, I'm not going to penalize. And there's one guy in the crowd or a couple guys in the crowd go, oh, like, that's dirty racing. Like, you know, what are you thinking? Um, But we race that way. And I don't like that sometimes we act like we, you know, for whatever reason, maybe want to generalize or not talk about, like, what the rules are. But then it just makes it that much harder for a new driver to understand what they're supposed to do unless they just get passed by Pauly, like, four times and he knocks him off, like, every single lap, you know? But um, I, I think that that well, I mean, that's even less of a debate than what Aaron and I thought it was, you know, is <laughs> everyone that we got on here is pretty, pretty much on the same page. Don't go clean a guy out. But if he gets you right, there's a lot of places to pass. But let's go from there into, um, you know, the it, it goes on kind of what the point Braden said, right? This is a low horsepower go kart. We got a really, really soft tire 
Brandon, you were saying you were breaking only about two times around the racetrack. Colin, is that about the same for you on the layout we were on, just barely brushing them with how sticky the rubber is? Yeah, it weren't really getting on the brakes too hard there. Um, yeah, I'll have maybe two spots. And do from your experience, right? And and maybe Ryan will go to you next too. I mean, would you like would a would a harder tire? Would you welcome a harder tire compound than where they've got, or you know, staying with the Vega but going to a different model? Uh, I personally really like the uh, the red. I mean, I like the Vega blue, but they don't run those anymore. I think those were even softer than the uh, the red. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I I really like the reds. They seem to be a pretty good balance, in my opinion. What about you, Ryan? With the way the racing kind of shook out with how sticky the rubber is, right? I mean, it, it uh, well, it takes out some of the stuff the comments, I feel like, are talking about. But what, what do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's definitely a good tire to race on. I mean, I think it's just has something to do with the track layout. As you would mentioned, you know, there's only a handful of braking points, and you really have to have the cart rolling to be able to pass. I mean, I think if you're on a harder tire or a more technical track, it would come down more to the driver rather than being wide open and just trying to – you know, get the roll and stuff it in on people. So it, it may make it a little bit more technical and more challenging with either harder tire or more technical track. But, you know, I, I think for this size of, you know, for the, the size of the grand, you know, the number of competitors are there, you know, you're not really going to find too many, uh, if any, locations in the United States that could, that could host that race. That's what's so tricky, right? Like, uh, I, I get like, uh, I, I know I've probably gotten flack for coming off in a way that is like, looking down on on the lower speed of being easier but when you have the soft tire and you're not braking as much it's still difficult racing i don't want to take away it's super hard to win because you have to be in a right position time the draft right make the right passes and all but it's no different than like you know uh the nascar debate that they've been going through for a number of years now where you know the that seems that the sanctioning body wants to go to this lower horsepower higher downforce pack racing everywhere we are because it's more entertaining for the fans tightens the field up levels the playing field but when you add more horsepower or you make the cars harder to drive it puts it more in the driver's hands you know and we go to grands i'm not sure what more they could do with that layout um you know to to pit because brandon you made a good point they were pitting guys on the oval right this year yeah i mean they were pitting people everywhere <clears throat> it's really hard to say with with the layout at newcastle like I went to multiple uh, 206 races this year, and we've kind of struggled with this at almost every track we've gone to, which with the South Series, we went to a lot of big draft-dependent tracks, but I still even think with like a harder tire, we'd be able to, it would be way harder for the car to go through the corner, so you'd actually have to slow down more. Mm -hmm. And I think it would make <clears> the <throat> racing better because it'd be not easier to pass, but there'd be a longer break zone, so you actually could get alongside someone and actually um like have to outbreak them instead where right now you're kind of just going full throttle into the corner the guy on the outside's going full throttle into the corner and you're kind of hoping that you both make it through the corner <laughs> without hitting each other and um it's just hard and that's i think another reason why it's really easy to stay on the outside of people is because you have so much grip with the soft tire that you can just roll around the outside and you really are not losing any time whereas if you had a hard tire you'd be sliding off the track by yourself without even getting hit on the inside Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, with the, the right the right kind of tire, like the mojos were so hard, you could overheat them too, right? Like that was always a big, uh, and it still kind of is with the heavier classes like in the X30 racing where you've got to manage it a little bit. If you drive too hard and you overheat the tires, then you're going to be greasy for a couple laps. So with the right harder tire, you could have it where, you know, you drive it too hard and you're still sliding for grip even more so and the driver pays a little bit more, but you put it more more in that you know driver spectrum but colin you say you like it are you, are you just a fan of uh you know playing the, the chess match game and the pack racing more yeah i mean i think it's just a different type of racing like i said it is more mental or like you said more mental chess match type i don't know i think i think of it as different than the x30 whereas that i mean i said it before where x30 is very like reactionary fast like you said dive in corners make pass fully you have to be smart like if he's smart boat in all racing, but yeah, chess match, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Like it, uh, you know, it's almost kind of like a, uh, like a spectrum of like two different types on a graph, you know, where you could, you could have more speed, right. And you kind of take less of the pack racing into it and then you slow the speeds down or you make it where it's, it's not as difficult as an individual to drive. And then the skill level of like, you know, playing the chess goes up a little bit higher. Um, go into the last, uh, last couple notes we had, the starts were, 
I don't know. Where did everybody feel that they were with the starts this weekend, with the field sizes, how they were doing the start procedures? Ryan, in the Legends class, was everybody playing nice, realizing they got to go to work on Monday? Yeah, they were. It, it didn't get too crazy. I mean, there was a little bit of pushing, and uh, even some of the some of the other drivers had asked, you know, how much how much pushing is tolerated, and you know, they stated just a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it didn't get too crazy. I know Brandon's start was completely different, though. Yeah, he had a little bit different in the light yeah, class. Yeah, well, rock us through that, Brandon. Yeah, I honestly don't really know what happened. Uh, got through turn one completely fine, and then all of a sudden, like on that short shoot, I just had a cart doing just basically on top of me and basically throwing me out of the seat completely. It really hurt and I'm very sore today still, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how that happened or why it happened because normally you get run over on entry of the corner, not mm -hmm. on exit. Um, but I think it was just like a combination. Like we were talking about how they said in the driver's meeting, you had to give everyone space on the start, which I think is honestly sometimes worse because then you get the people behind that are like closing the gap really quick and then they hit someone in front of them and then that launches them into the cart in front of them because they're not actually like bumper to bumper or i think sometimes when you're bumper to bumper into the corner the starts go smoother because there's no like wiggle room the carts mm -hmm. settle down all the time paulie what about you what do you think of the starts here uh, i thing? thought the starts were were all right besides uh obviously brandon's I didn't even know Brandon had a cart on top of him until a few laps when I was finally riding around and I, I looked at the front pack and I didn't see him and then I saw him <laughs> in turn one. But uh no, I thought the starts were fairly fairly decent besides that. Uh I don't like giving a gap deal because I know I was starting around the ninth area and light every time and I would always try to set myself up for a for a nice gap, which uh I did one time and I didn't know that you had to wait till you pass start finish line to actually move out of your lanes. So uh, that's the only thing I didn't like was that you had to wait pretty much until you pass the flagman. So I, I wasn't a big fan of that, but uh, other than that, I thought it was pretty good. Anything notable for you on the starts there, Colin? Uh, kind of a mix of both of Brandon and Polly. I liked staying in the tram lines to pass the uh, start finish line. I felt like it almost calmed down turn one, but I really didn't like leaving a gap in between carts because like Brandon said, you get people coming up with so much speed and then they've almost launched the person into the person in front of them. And I think that I'm pretty sure that's how you got ran over Brandon. Like I think they got launched onto your left rear tire and just up and over. So you get like more like slamming instead of just kind of riding the bumper a little bit with the way the gaps are. Yeah. That's yeah, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So where do we feel then, right? If if they they if they let the pushing go, is it slow enough? If they wait on the green where you don't need to push back bumpers, because um, I know that it's not run. I don't know if I'm the biggest fan of them. Still, we know Brandon, me, you, Paulie, Braden, that there's plenty of ways where at this point it doesn't seem like they do a whole lot because everyone's found good ways to really keep them down and drive with them. But do you guys would you welcome them at an event this size? What do you think, Brandon? You first. Um, I don't know. I don't think it would really fix any of the problems that they really have. I don't think it would, it wouldn't solve the start thing because people would still be hitting. I mean, we still see that even with the series that have pushback bumpers. Um, and then like 206 is so dependent on drafting that I feel like it would, uh, it would kind of hinder, like hurt that a little bit because you can't draft as easy with a pushback bumper, obviously. Um, I don't know. I don't think I would want to see it because I obviously hate the pushback bumpers as so as it is, but um, I don't know. Let's hear what other people have to say. Colin, what do you think on them? I agree. I hate them. I, and I, think, <laughs> I don't think it'd be very good for the 206 just because sometimes, I mean, you know how sometimes it's not smart to pass and let's say you're in second and you have third place pushing you and you're like three cart links back from first, but you don't want to pass them. You just want to pump draft them. You may get a big run, but it's a 206 car, so you don't want to lift. So you may hit them pretty hard, and it's almost like you'd almost have to start breaking on the straightaway sometimes. So, yeah, I I agree. I I like I don't know if they they do a whole lot because to me the only thing that they've really cleaned up that used to be bigger in the X30 and the the K starts was like I mean you had a higher horsepower go kart, so what, if you were full throttle in like the fifth row back to the tenth row to the twentieth row like. That would, that would really load the field up going in the first corner. And so the guys in the front row, they were always screwed. But I feel like with just nine horsepower and a 206, 
you could you could be full throttle in at the back, and it's not nearly that severe of like an, an issue for the front couple rows if they allowed the pushing like in years past. I don't I don't know if you guys would agree or not, Brandon. Obviously, you've got a lot, and Colin both, and I guess Polly. All three of you guys have a lot of experience in both going back to the years in the right before the pushback era on the two stroke side. I don't think it would make any bit of a difference at all on the starts, Polly. What about you? I mean, I don't I don't think the pushing's heavy enough that if you um, if you just let them push and not give a gap in 206, that it would have these crazy turn one wrecks. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really think the pushbacks would, would change anything. I agree with both Brandon and Colin. Uh, it was actually kind of nice not having them. So, you know, if a little Canadian bugged you a little <laughs> bit. Nah, I'm just kidding. But, uh, I mean, I don't – I think, you know, if you're trying to catch up to someone, but – if, if a guy's alone and you just want to push them, like Colin said, it's you kind of have to start using the brake to not hit them so hard to push your stuff in. So uh, I, I, I'm I not a fan of the pushback, so uh, it was it was nice not having them. Yeah. Well, um, while we have, uh, you know, a couple different faces on the show, Ryan, you know, as a, a guy that's now a, a winner of this event, uh, did you won here before at Grands, or, yeah, or is this win number one? This is win number one. So coming out of the weekend, right, what, what stuck out to you, man? Notables, good, bad, positive, neutral, right? Like what was something you come away walking away from CKNA Grands this year with? Um, I mean, I think it was a great event. You know, there was, you know, 400 plus entries, a lot of really good competition. Um, you know, I mean, I know there's some, some craziness going on in some of the, you know, some of the races, but in all, I thought it was a really good event. And, and Colin, what about you, man? I mean, we, I feel like we've hit some of the points, right? The qualifying stuff a little bit. The starts were a little bit different this year. What what others or anything that was kind of notable, noteworthy for you as a guy who's won it many times before and was up in the mix again this year? Um, no, not really. I mean, I definitely think the competition this year was by far the hardest. Um, there's a lot of two cycle guys coming over now, too. So it's just a lot of people. It's very very luck dependent too so oh yeah yeah that that's that that's the other part right like when the when the draft makes half a second paulie how far back do you qualify in uh, one of those classes right like 27th 34th 34th I, uh, without a toe i went out in the happy hour and i got a nice little toe with colin and brandon and uh i think overbeck and somebody else was in there and then i go out for uh qualifying not thinking you know i'm like all right maybe 15th worst and i come in and i'm like you and where are we at and he's like oh no not good and I'm like, <laughs> well like what do you mean like 15th 20th he's like no 34th and i was like yeah you're the one that right. over back the toe away from me i was like god damn it polly <laughs> yeah but no i mean honestly for qualifying i think they should just do like a another another eight minute session like because then you have time to, to figure out to get a draft, and if you don't, that's kind of your own fault. I would like to see that, but who knows. Is there – um? sometimes it seems like in the, the X30 or the K qualifying sessions where, um, you know, you could two guys could be the best pusher, two-car tandem, you know, duo there is, and the guy that's third in line behind them, two cars back, does way better because he still sucks up no matter how hard they mm -hmm. push. I don't feel like that happens as much in 206. It seems like in 206 when two guys get hooked up, the third guy back there doesn't really suck up as much. Am I off base on that? Or Because that's the only other thing that qualifying is kind of a crapshoot on is even when you allow the pushing, like you're still fighting to be the last guy in the line. But if you allow pushing in 206, I think you know the guys that push together well are going to outdo anyone that just rides behind them. What, what do you think, Brandon? You first. I mean, um, <clears throat> yeah – I think that's definitely true, but we also saw like if you look at like the the happy hour times versus the qualifying times, um, especially for medium, you saw it the the pole sitter actually went faster in qualifying than anyone did in practice when we were all pushing all together. So okay. I think that like actual like one card draft suck up actually is a really big thing because mm -hmm. Overbeck actually did get it. He passed me on that lap and. I could still, I could have pushed him around the entire track, but he qualified first and I qualified like 25th or something like that. But it was just that one like straightaway that he actually got the draft got him just a crazy, crazy lap time. Yeah. Cause then that's the other way to solve the, the quality issues. It, you know, if you want to call them issues, right. Is if you want to have four, you know, groups of, uh, 
40 together, just give you guys five minutes or 10 minutes. Like Colin said, you'll at least, you know, go pretty different at, at maybe at worst, right. There's not as big of a swing from like, you know, third back to the top two guys pushing together. You know, I don't feel like it would be as, I don't feel like it would be as much of a mess, right? Because the whole reason we even do it at all the major USPKS and Scusa races now, well, have we been doing three lap qualifying at Scusa? I can't. Polly, it's group qualifying at Scusa still, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The whole reason we get away from it is because we were playing games with each other because we didn't want to push. We wanted to be the guy at the end of the line. I don't see that happening as much in the 206 practice sessions. Um, so maybe it wouldn't be too bad in the in the, in the the quality stuff either. Um. And then, yeah, I mean, it seems like the event went smooth. You know, the guys do a, a, a good job with, uh, you know, having a lot of contingency prizes, right? The turnout's really good each year. So, you know, not not a whole lot else negative to say on that front, right? Um, the closing statements are here for a little bit. We had a couple other, well, not a whole lot of questions, I think. Come on in. Um, Aaron, am I missing anything that we needed to pull these guys on and really kind of mess with them a little bit on? <laughs> That we wanted. Um, I thought there was. Um, I thought Brandon wanted to talk about the car, the card counts in the final. Oh and yeah. Like the number of cards that are starting and stuff. I don't remember if Brandon put that on or not, um, or if I did. But I thought that was a topic that we might want to cover because we talked about it before, and this is a completely different event now. Where you know we were talking about it with a from a two stroke side PKS excuse and stuff like that. Like card counts for the final. Are we happy with where the number of drivers that made the final was, or do we think that it was maybe too little, or do you think we could have let them all go out there? You know, looking at how this series is supposed to be, you know, the, the, the budget conscious series, they're not going to spend as much money on maybe getting, you know, 20 of the best race officials out on track. Do we think that the 50 cards that started in medium and light was, was good. what do you think, Brandon? Um, I'm honestly glad not more cards started in light because I probably would have got hit by someone, um, <laughs> but I do kind of see where they're coming from because it's supposed to be like a, um, a more economical series that everyone should be able to race. But I think what they like a way to, there's a limit of how many cards you can put on the track where it actually becomes like safe and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I think they were kind of at the max of that. Cause I, how many do they start 50, I believe. Right. Yeah, 50, yeah, 50, 50 in medium and light and then 40 in sportsman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like 50, that's kind of, you're getting to the max of like how many, cards can safely be on the track especially with the starts um but the way to like fix um like what they did when i went to uh, france for the IAMI race is they actually had like separate features for those people that didn't make the race so then it kind of includes everyone that they get a an actual like feature race so you're thinking like how in like like dirt racing does like a c main b main a main that's what they do in Europe then for like the IAMI yeah, stuff? Yeah, essentially, like yeah. European stuff? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Colin, Colin, Ryan, what would you guys think about that? And instead of running as many cards, maybe we do, you know, the UFC main, B main, A main. You, can you transfer out when they do it in Europe? Uh, I think the top two transfer yeah, out. Yeah, top two. Okay, yeah. yeah. So C main, B main, A main, top two, four, six, whatever, transfer out of the race. What would you guys think of that? Colin? I personally think that would be a good idea. I mean. I do too. Yeah. If, you could limit like the classes down to maybe 35 or something, 35, even 40, like just limit it a little bit. The officialing will be, it'll be much easier for the officials to actually pay attention to everything and catch more stuff. And mm -hmm. it wouldn't just be so chaotic. I'm glad Jason Burgess is in the chat here joining in. Cause I wanted to, uh, he made a good point, right? Like obviously time's a big yeah. constraint, you know, Sunday was strictly LCQs, warmups and mains. And, and at least they were able to fit in a warm up before the mains. They want to do a little bit of the pageantry to go. Um, I think that if uh, at least, so one thing that, that noticed here, Braden, you brought this up, right? Like you thought it was cool that they, they, they had the pageantry coming onto the grid. You know, there was a little bit of a wait time between each main, right? Can you describe what you were saying about that? Yeah, so I thought it was uh, actually really cool how they did the format. Um, so I've actually done, well, I raced in uh, in Italy in 2017, did the Rock International Final. And it was quite similar to that where I think it's really cool that, you know, Sunday is the race day. And, you know, they have everyone push out onto the track. Um, there's like, we're out all out there for like 15, 20 minutes before each race. So like, it's all, it's all quiet. Like normally we don't hear quiet at the racetrack, 
And the fact that there's like actually 20, 30 minutes in between each race where nothing's happening makes it feel like each race actually is more of like its own event. And like even um, like, it, I don't know, it just it gave it a cool feel to how they gave it like a little bit of a build up in between each one. Yeah, there's like a, a little more gravity, you know, to it. And that's to me. Right, like CKNA Grands, which uh, I I didn't see any grumblings. I saw a little bit last year because I don't know if last year they had raised the entry fee up and this year it stayed the same. But I hadn't seen anyone complain about the entry fee. But you know, this is the the 206 crowd, right? This is meant to be the most budget oriented crowd in all the sport. All carters care about you know stretching the dollars like any racer, right? But this is the lowest. Uh, you know, dollar you can spend to race a field this big and with this much talent in it. And at least for everybody being happy with the format and happy with the amount of track time they got, I, you know, that's a good sign that that could, uh, uh, I think that's a good sign to have stuff like C mains or B mains. Cause like what Jason's talking about time in the race day format, um, to have the C mains or the B mains, if they don't want to sacrifice the stuff on Sunday, um, you know, you would probably have to, run some of them like Saturday afternoon and, and maybe in the whole weekend, right. Cut a practice session, you know, to, to make room in the format. But if, and this is a big if, but I hope that we're gravitating towards like this way as an industry, because we always go one end of the spectrum and then come back to the other for a little while. Everybody was really focused on how much, how many laps they'd get per dollar. If you throw that out the window, then you can cut the field sizes down and the, and the promoter doesn't get any bad flack because, you know, in Europe with some of those races, right? Like Miami grants, for example, or Miami worlds, Brandon, right? You're on track one times a day, sometimes two times a day, and that's it normally. Sometimes you have an off day almost, it seems, right? Uh, I don't think we, we never had an off day. Some of the other classes did because they didn't have as many entries, but like the X30 senior class had 140 entries, I believe. So we had to do practice and qualifying, and then we had to do actually seven heat races so that you went against everybody. And then they did the DCB on that one night. But like over there, the days were so long. We ran from... 8 a.m. to almost 9 p.m. because we wound up running at night sometimes. So the days were really long, but an X30 senior never got a day off, but there were some of like the other classes like Masters or uh, like the Super X30 or Shifter. They got, they probably got one or two days off in the middle of the event. Yeah. All the, it, that's almost, I, how many days was, how many days is the IAMI Worlds event? Because that's not I just believe. like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is it? No, definitely not. You were there, I believe we tested the weekend before, and then you got Monday off, and then you started Tuesday testing, and then you qualified on Wednesday, I believe. And then you did your okay, heat so races you're adding... Wednesday. You did your heat races Wednesday through Saturday, and then Sunday was just finals. Okay, gotcha. So that would be asking all – I feel like I'd be asking a lot from the, – especially the crowd that comes to this race, but for – Yeah, it's, way, it's, it's, way, it's definitely – event, but... It's definitely way too long to do for like any of the events we have over here, but that was like a world championship race. So that's why mm -hmm. I think it was okay for that type of event, but not a, not a normal race we have here in the States. I already think most of the events we have here in the States are way too long as so as it is. Um, that's just because we have I, too much damn practice time, way too many yeah, practice exactly. sessions, way I mean, too many <laughs> practice sessions. I think we need to go back to, you show up on Thursday afternoon, practice Friday, race Saturday, Sunday and go home. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Brandon. Three, yeah. three day show. Three day show. Four four days is tough, man. But I mean for it Grands is. this weekend, right? It would be you'd probably only get two rounds of practice on Friday. You know, if cool. you sounds good. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, from what it sounds like, you know, if, I, if it's a soft enough tire and it's a low horsepower motor, it's not like you need that many days to get up to speed and dial in because you're gonna have grip and you only gotta break to one or two places. So if it's if it's like that, I mean NASCAR can go to Talladega and not do any practice or qualifying, and everybody's fine. We can do the same thing with this stuff, at least you know if we don't go to as technical of a racetrack. Not that we couldn't if we did it at a technical racetrack, because then the guys that are really good would shine, right? If you show up and you don't have it, it's just uh, you know uh, making sure nobody goes and tests the weekend before, or if you put a week ban and they test the two weeks before. Um, but yeah, well, I'd be down for that too. You got four sessions of practice on Thursday. That should be enough. You could just jump like more up and straight into qualifying on Friday. You're already there. Uh, everybody was already there except for maybe like two drivers I heard of that couldn't make it till Friday afternoon. You could just make Friday most of Friday or just make Friday part of the racing events. 
and go from there. If you guys, it, yeah. I don't know what you guys would think of that, but we were already there, so yeah, I think that would have been that would have been like, good. Just I like uh, Trevor's idea. Hot yeah. laps and go. Hot to laps and go. Hot laps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd I mean, fun. We're, you know, what are we showing up to there for, right? This goes back here. Well, I was going to wait on Q&A till after the break, but I think we can field this question right before, you know, like if you need all six sessions, you probably aren't at the level where you should be racing this type of event. This is cool that everybody gets to go, but, you know, if you want to make it where you got to qualify to run them, I mean, then, then you know you're getting the best and nobody should be having the excuse that they need more track time, you know? Because there, there definitely was some of that, right? Like there was uh, black flags and some of those heats for slow drivers. And, you know, that then the then they come off the track and they're mad at the promoter. They didn't get to run all the laps in the session and mess up the lead battle, you know? Well, I think that was mostly wrecks. It was somebody that get caught up in a big wreck. I don't think anybody actually got black flagged because of pace that I saw, at least. I saw a few drivers that get caught up in a wreck and they were bit off because something was bent. And then they'd be caught up to the leaders by four to go and they'd get pulled off then. I don't know if I saw anybody off just because of pace. There might have been a couple more in the classes I wasn't watching. I hope not. I mean, maybe kid cart, <laughs> but, you know. That was the only one I was thinking of, maybe. If you've been racing like a lot of the Legends guys in Ryan's case and, uh, you know, you're getting lapped down an eight-lap Pete Ryan, I don't know if you'd uh, – I wouldn't have the guts to stay out there. I've been driving that many <laughs> years, and I'm getting lapped down. I'd pack up and go home. <laughs> On a minute 15 lap. <laughs> I'd be I'd be embarrassed. I'd hope that nobody saw me get black flagged. I wouldn't be complaining to the race director at all. I'd take it and go back with tail between my legs. <laughs> uh, we'll take a quick commercial break, guys. Lots of good questions here. Thank you for sending them all in. We will answer as many as we can uh, right after this. So, uh, again, stick with us, guys. We'll be right back. Driver Cart Store USA is a cart parts supplier that racers and retailers can count on when they need reliable advice and service. We focus on servicing all racers with honesty and pride while maintaining customer satisfaction. We carry a full stock of Kart Republic and Tony Kart chassis, as well as IAMI and Vortex Rock engines. We've also got a host of other parts available and in stock, such as products from Rev Performance Materials, Jekko Racing Seats, and more. We have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And on top of that, if your order exceeds $200, shipping is on us. Check out all we have to offer today by visiting us online at cartstore-usa.com. At New Gen Motorsport, we're committed to using our 10 plus years of experience and knowledge to help grow the sport of karting from the bottom up. Our goal is to make karting more accessible to the average person, lessening the financial burden of getting started, and making the learning curve as small as possible. Our passion is training and developing drivers, mechanics, and engineers to not only be the best they can be in karting, but also for careers in the much larger world of professional motorsports. A strong foundation makes building bigger easier. Let us be that foundation for your karting and motorsports career. Be part of the new generation of motorsport. Contact us today to schedule your test day, arrive and drive race event, or to inquire about how we can help get you started in your own new gen racing kart. Don't settle for a national engine builder. Take care of yourself with an international one. SRP Engines is a global industry leader in engine services, specializing in engine formulas such as KZ, OK, OKJ, and Mini 60. SRP Engines is the engine of choice for Magic Kart USA and helped power North America's number one ranked pro shifter driver, AJ Myers, to the 2021 Superkarts USA Pro Tour National Championship. SRP Engines can also service any spec engine class of your choice, including IAMI and Rock divisions. However, if you're looking for the absolute choice when it comes to KZ shifter engines, there is nobody better. For more information, contact Amar Sonata at srp-engines.com. KC Happy Hour is proudly presented by the Rock Sonoma Karting Championship presented by Cameron Race Promotions, the most competitive Northern California karting series. Featuring a two-day format with practice on Saturday and racing on Sunday, multiple track configurations, and a massive prize structure including tickets to Rock Vegas, race car test opportunities, and race rewards. Rock Sonoma is the training ground of multiple national karting champions each year and race car champions as well. Featuring a full Rock Cup USA class structure with each race we can stream live via YouTube, it's a series you cannot miss. For more info, check us out online at zanzaroucarding.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. So we've got a lot of your questions that we've kind of starred and, and put off off to the side so that way we can have uh, our, our panel here kind of go through each one one by one. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's go to, to Randy's question here and I'll pass it off to you, Ryan, as the first one to, to answer Ryan. I, I, am not familiar with how much you were behind the wheel this year, but what would you think on a question like this? Should you have it where guys have to qualify to get to this level? 
Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I don't know what the qualifying criteria would be. Uh, you know, is it participation in the the Grands or I'm sorry, the CKNA Regional Series to get there? I don't know. That's that's a little bit difficult. I don't know if it would. I mean, I agree with some of the comments earlier. It would maybe help with the quality of driver, if you will. But at the same time, I don't know if it would if it would hurt the number of entries. Uh, Brandon, you work with a variety of different guys. What do you, what is your take on this? Um, I mean, I think that should be more something on, which is kind of hard with the 206, but it's more of something like on the team owners to say like, yeah, you're ready to go to this style race. I know I do it with a lot of my guys that mm. I just kind of not tell them not to go to the race, but I'm like, uh, I don't know if maybe next year or maybe like we do more practice and then we, then we'll be ready to go to that race. Um, but I think it's more something on the teams, which is hard with the 206 because there's not a lot of the big teams. It's a lot of more like one or two people putting out a trailer, which is really good, but I don't know. It's kind of hard to say because it would definitely obviously not down hype the event, but it would uh, take a lot of entries away, I believe, which is never really good. What about you, Colin? I mean, I agree basically with Brandon said, with what Brandon and Ryan said. Um, I think if you did do that, the only way you could really possibly do it would be if you competed in the regional series, um, then you would end up hurting your entries so bad that then you would come to they would have issues i think getting these bigger tracks and then also with all the prizes and all that stuff which is part of the draw and it would just be a big knock-on effect that would i think hurt the event overall paulie anything to add yeah i mean i i agree with all of them i think it'd be hard to uh to organize that but uh i feel like you know there's a lot of families that just like to go and have have a great time and maybe they know they're not going to win but they like to go have a good time and try to do the best they can with the budget they can so i feel like it'd be be pretty hard to uh tell a bunch of families that they can't come yeah i i think it's like uh i don't know i think the only way that it could work right is obviously you have the ckna regionals and then if ckna could get um you know Go to, pitch it to clubs or other regional series to get like a CKNA sanctioning stamp. Stamp they would pay for, understanding that CKNA would be directing entries to certain races as qualifiers, almost like punches in the Rotax system, right? Because if you have you, it has to be financially feasible. Like Brandon said, you know, if they turn away the entries, then you know they're making less money, and then that means that you know the event would, in theory, get poor in one in in multiple ways obviously there'd be less drivers there so it wouldn't feel as grand but also um it wouldn't be able to hire as many officials or as many tech guys to try and enforce tech enforce you know you know good racecraft there um and so then to make up for that lack of entries like i don't think that they could get enough money from a regional that would want that would believe they would make up the entry fees right like let's say the they'd go to the kpx karting series in the southwest you know or go to the gopro motorplex club races that would be um you know definitely strong enough events you could say that's a regional qualifier right how would you sell those guys on doing that versus just eating it up on your own pocket and this is where Unfortunately, by not having a, an internet or a national sanctioning body, CKNA doesn't benefit. You know, they don't benefit by turning away the entries to make it better. I mean, they could make it more solidly run of an event, but it doesn't make more sense for them financially. Um, let's see what we, what else do we have here? Uh, Jeff Scott, why doesn't Newcastle fix some of the runoff and exits on some of the corners? This may solve the problem if you get potted. If you only lose a few spots instead of twenty, concrete with rumbles would be get better than grass and dirt. Paulie, your home track has a lot of concrete and rumbles. What is your take on this? Uh, I guess don't get potted off. I don't. I don't really know. <laughs> besides that, uh, I feel like why would the track fix anything when you know they still have a bunch of people that come to them and a bunch of people series love love the track, so they don't see anything wrong with it. I don't think. Brandon, you were shaking your head before I even finished the comment. I know you got some thoughts here. Yeah, don't don't add concrete on the exit. It kind of not ruined GoPro, but it definitely didn't didn't help it. I think uh, that just opens a whole new can of worms of the track limits stuff, and it's very hard for a series to um, police that on top of everything else they have to. I personally think they honestly not ruined Newcastle, but they 
definitely made it way less technical of a track when they added all the runoff they did i don't know what six seven years ago probably now um i liked it a lot better when it was just a solid drop off and if you dropped the wheel you were going off the track spinning off so it made it way more difficult to drive any, uh, anyone else got more comments anything to, to add on that it seems like no one really wants to add any extra runoff Braden, you're grinning the, over there the, the only good uh concrete with rumbles is if i'm sure you guys remember when gopro was first first made out of the last corner if you went out there it would feel like you were gonna die and destroy the go-kart <laughs> that was the only like concrete with rumbles that was like okay i'm not going out there <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be rough then and then uh okay fair enough it, it adds a, i mean maybe filling it in right like when we run the track backwards it's got some pretty heavy dips now at the uh, the exit of the racetrack, but that's a uh, that's an expense, like Polly said, right? Well, if you're a track owner, why spend a bunch of money on sod every six months to keep getting it tore up? Because you know you guys are knocking them off. But there are some pretty big dips that have <clears> developed <throat> on the racetrack now, and this is this is interesting too. That I so Rock does this to a degree, and what Je Jeff Scott saying he's a uh, hot lap three classes, then race three classes, hot lap four, then race them. So talking, putting the warm up sessions and the finals staggered throughout the day instead of everybody warm up and then everybody race um you know from your guys perspective did you need all that time in between your warm-up and your main event to make more changes on the car or were you about where you're at ryan you first what do you think no uh, I, I i i agree with jeff's assessment there because you know when we had warm-ups early in the morning you know in the master's class i was i was you know a contender can't take anything away from fag and he was super fast but you know actually i went the wrong way with my changes for the feature and that's that's 100 percent on me um but yeah if, if we would have you know ran three or hot lap three and then race three and then you know if the practice would have been closer to the race i would have made a different chassis selection what about the rest of you guys do you guys for that against that you know brandon what do you think from a team owner's deal uh, i'm definitely for that i think i mean we had i don't even know what like five hours between our medium session and our uh, mm -hmm our uh, feature i mean honestly the morning warm-up was kind of just a waste of time just make sure your motor ran and that was kind of it you didn't really learn anything from it um but yeah i, I definitely like the split kind of day type deal that would be something new right like I, i'd i'd be curious if a series ever tried axing morning warm-ups because you don't always get that in car racing it's kind of become the standard if we wanted to run c and b mains you could just put guys out there and not do a warm-up you know i mean you make a big change overnight right but like Braden, you know this from the road to indie stuff you've done it's not like you get a warm-up session if you total the car in race one you got to hope it stays together for race two which is what it is yep our warm -up, more our morning warm-up half the time at road to indy was our 8 a.m races at road america <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that'd be uh that'd be a way then then too if uh if you want, if they were worried about track time and you wanted to have C mains and B mains to cut the fields down, I mean, 50, 50 guys is just a lot. It's just hard to catch, especially if you want to have like passing rules, like going one way or the other on the pushing. You know, we've beat that into the ground. I think a lot of guys have had all good, good comments on it, but I don't think anyone's way, way off. Um, let's see. This was from uh, Rob Kraut asking, "Do we need the three heat races?" You know, from from the from the the classes where you had the ABCD groups, which was a bit of a funky way that the formatting went, right? Mm -hmm. But you could you could in theory do pre final A, pre final B, rack it up, go to the main, and hope you don't crash, right? Brandon, what do you think? Three heats? Yes, no. Uh, I like the three heats just because it's obviously more track time. If you take a heat away, then it's less track time for the the whole event, which is what we're all there for is to be on the racetrack, obviously. Um, but yeah, the way they split up the A, B, C, D, you definitely have to do three heats because otherwise not everyone would uh, face each other. Yeah. like th I, I thought it's... actually, so Scusa used to do it um, in a smart way, whereas like when they when it was Vegas, it was always A, B, C, D. But like the couple years that we had Summer Nats where we had like 60 guys, they would do the same size groups, but it would just be A, B, C, and it would be A versus B, A versus C, and it was two heats. They probably could just do that, and that would be pretty easy. The only downside with the rotation on that is it means one group gets fresher tires than another, like one less heat cycle than another because the order you go, right? So you'd have A versus B would run, 
And then when A runs against C, C hasn't run yet. So they've got one less heat cycle on the tires. But from a 206 perspective and with a soft tire like what you had, did you guys feel like there would be any benefit to having one less heat cycle on your tires if you ran that kind of format? No, Brandon? not really. Not in the 206. I mean, honestly, on Friday morning, I think we put new tires on and we didn't. We went the same exact time as we did with our 20 sessional tires we got out of the dumpster. Colin, what about you? Would you see any any any? I I just think that'd be a point of complaining. I don't think it would make a difference. You? I don't think there'd be much difference. Um, the only thing I worry about about taking away heat races would be then you would be increasing field size again. So the less heats there are, if you split them into four groups, then there's less people. If you split into two groups, then you have big groups again. So that's it's just, true. It's a balance that they have to find. It's yeah. a hard balance to find. So, what would your number be for the max carts you'd want on the racetrack? You'd feel safe if you were thirty fifth or fifth, getting the same treatment officiating wise. I mean, I think like thirty five or forty is like doable, which I mean they could have done this year with two or three heats. But if it grows anymore, it's just something they have to worry about if it grows more. Yeah. Well, the LCQ, the biggest LCQ is only like twenty two, right? I don't think the biggest LCQ was all that big. And did Legend Legends had an LCQ, or did they all fifty start, Ryan? No, no, it was the, the entire field started. Yeah. So that's the, the other issue that, you know, we, we've beat the beat the USPKS guys up a little bit on it this year um, and Scusa too. Uh, but I think there's a different understanding at that event versus like what we talk about with a lot of families that this is like the race they want to show up to. Um, the one big one of the year, not like I'm going up to a high level and I understand I'm going to get, you know, I might not make the show. Um is like legends is right at 50 you know like you, you say okay 45 is my cap and then you get 47 and are you going to run an lcq or are you going to cut down and and you end up inching your way up to 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 50 drivers uh on on the on the racetrack but 50s 50s pushing uh, a little bit um but yeah like mm. Do it, doing less heats also just means that qualifying matters more and the heats matter mm -hmm. more. I don't know if that would mean less wrecking in the heats or more. Did, did Like, Pauly, for example, did you feel like you could be more aggressive with three heats versus a single pre-final of, like, if you crashed? Or was the mentality the same? Uh, I, I mean, mentality was probably the same. Probably just go out and do the best you can. It's really just how it is. Should That should how it be every time, I guess. But, uh... No, I feel like I don't know. I mean, I felt like the the eight to fifteen place wise range. Like if you were stuck, if you were trying to come through the field, especially like last weekend, like in a two hundred six, like if or not if in a two cycle, if you're if you're clearly faster, like your top five, and you're trying to go through, you can easily go through and get inside the top ten. But like with that, like if you're stuck in that eight to fifteen, like. Nah, you just got pretty much a bunch of Canadians in that area that just pass you right <laughs> back. And, uh, but yeah, I don't even know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where we can go with that. Cause this is something we, we thought about talking about was the, the progressive heat style formats. How do we feel about that versus the Vegas style of you qualify and you start, say you qualify 36 that puts you in group D in 12th or let's say, you know that that's where you start every race do we like that more or do we prefer that or do we prefer the the progressive heat system what do we think um on that kind of stuff i i know i know with I, you and brandon it, it, we're anti-progressive colin are you for the progressive stuff or are you are you wanting a static grid i like the progressive personally and really you guys you guys were probably for it there too because you guys qualified so far back i think you would have liked it right uh, i like the static because it's definitely uh way less confusing like this year was just way con way confusing and i honestly didn't understand how i got lined up in some of the spots i did because like one heat race i would finish fourth and then all of a sudden i'd come to the grid i'd start like 10th and it like how's that even possible but um it didn't didn't really make much sense to me but i like the <clears throat> the static of it just puts that much more pressure on qualifying and that's why the qualifying i think needs to be fixed because it's so important to qualify up front I mean, did the, the progressive stuff, I mean, the per, so to, to lay it out for our viewers, the progressive stuff of where you lined up for each heat was 
it was it was was it based off your points to that point or was it just off of who you beat in the previous session in your group because if that's progressive then it's that was so here's what my understanding is and what i believe it is if it's progressive which means it's just off the previous session and not off your heat tally to that point then you're racing the guys in the line you line up with so you know, you could finish third, and that could mean you could be pole in your next heat because you beat everyone on the inside lane, or you could be, you know, starting sixth because you finished behind the two guys that beat you were on the lane. So, so it that's the part that's your, confusing. It mattered on your points and the group you were in. So, like points too. Yeah, it was points and group. So, like you oh. got based on points of the two groups mm. combined, and it was just like <clears throat> it was very weird. Mm. Yeah, I thought. I, mean, I think that's it. what I got. From, that's what I got from it. But I don't know. I was really confused when I go went to the grid every time. <laughs> I don't know. A bunch of stuff didn't like really add up to me with the with the point structure. I feel like they made it way too confusing on themselves. What, are you, Colin? Like you're that. laughing at these guys. Did it make sense to you? <laughs> are they just stupid up yeah. there? <laughs> yeah, I think they're just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, you know, it's I, not I, far from I couldn't it. understand it's, why they were using the. Uh, the instead of doing like you know like usually when you win the heat you get zero points and then one two three and then after like they they started with what i think it was 100 points or something like that it, it, i don't know it was confusing and there was like seven decimal points that just didn't make any sense <laughs> i was there to race not to do math equations <laughs> All right. Uh, this is from Avery Scott. Did the top drivers ever run off the edge and know what those dirt holes do to your position? Colin, you went off the edge on the broadcast, the USPKS. What did it do to your position? Uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> went well. Uh, way backwards. <laughs> it took like two laps. But I think that comes back to what you guys were talking about earlier about adding more runoff. I mean, it kind of gets into like the F1 debate of should they have runoff or should they have grass or gravel. I think like if you go off the track, you should be punished for it. Like, I deserve to be punished for that. I went off the track. <laughs> it happened, so. That Facebook comment was uh, was written exactly like somebody who always holds the outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably, he might have got pushed off. I don't know if Avery did or, or uh, did or not. Um, let's see. Um, I, think, I think one of my drivers ran Avery off the track at one point. I will say that. Um, I'm pretty sure that one of the drivers I was coaching just smoked her right in scoreboard. So sorry about that, Avery. Um, but I didn't tell him to do that, but sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, we've, all, we've all driven off the track before. I don't think anybody is perfect. We've all had experiences with that. I'd be surprised <laughs> if, you know, Braden, have you never gone off track, never dropped the tire? Nope, never. Not once. Nope. No, he's, he's never dropped it. He's good. That's why perfect. Braden is where he is and we're all where we are during the weekends. <laughs> Well, not if you watch the last broadcast down at 15. <laughs> I wasn't on the broadcast. I was avoiding it. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, I think, a good way to end the show, right? There's no question. We've seen it in the comments. We've seen a lot of you guys trying to get us to get in on some social media drama over the weekend uh, when it came to uh, tire doping, right? There's rumors about it. I don't know enough. I haven't researched enough of any of that's true. And I can tell you, nobody here wants to get canceled for getting involved in any of that or piss off anyone that they know. But what's important in when we talk about uh, cost of this event, right? This is the slowest amount of dollars you can spend to race a lot of go-karts across the country. You know, when it comes to entry fee and the tire bill and, and the fact that this is an independent promoter, you know, CKNA is not the Vega tire impro importer. They're not the Briggs importer. Uh, so there's no extra money that can go in for crazy heavy tech, right? Park for May, Brandon, you've been, you've been to races that have had it. Colin, you've been to races that have had it. Braden, you've been to races that have had it. Paulie, I don't know. Do you have a background at, a, at an event where you've gone with this Park for May where they make you mount the tires right before the grid and, you know, keep the tires up there? No. Ryan, what what about you and your history? Have you seen anything like that where they keep your tires up at the grid? You got to dismount after you come off track and all that? Yeah, I have. So I was at Charlotte, I don't know, quite a number of years ago when they had the, you know, the Europeans come over and they had one, one of the World Cup races and it was, you know, they had Park for May. And I mean, I think it really does help eliminate a lot of that, but then there's going to be additional costs for somebody to manage the tires, make sure that all that's watched. Nobody's messing with anything while it's in Park for May. 
And that's that's exactly it. That's a. Ex- I'm so glad you put it like that, Ryan. I appreciate it because that's that's exactly the point that um, you know everyone's got to understand that you know as this event grows, if you want stuff like that, you know, to enforce on whether it's keeping guys from prepping tires or being intense in tech. I mean, and even just you know we outlined at the beginning of the broadcast, there's a baseline pay for people, but you know if you want Brandon Jarsacrack to come tune on your go kart, you can't pay him 200 a day. You know, it's a little bit higher than that to get him to go over there. So if you want really good people to know what they're looking at, when it comes to the tech barn, when it comes to, you know, tires, when it comes to officiating, like the entry fees are going to go up. And, and that's the the trickiest thing that everyone's got to come to come to terms with and decide, you know, what we want to do. CKNA has gotten a big audience, but it's also been a low budget audience that's part of the the lure of the event it's not as expensive as going ka x30 scusa uspks racing so you know if you want park for may to to take away the tire stuff everyone's got to buck up and say all right like someone ruined it for us you know colin decided he wanted to put go pee on his tires and now we all got to go to park for may and mount every single session like freaking cheater over there you know your dad pointed out right like you guys cheat every year obviously and get away with it right colin yeah, you know, WD-40 on the tires. Yeah, exactly. So, well, one thing I will say, I didn't see though. I mean, they were scanning tires, but maybe maybe some of the guys online saw it. You know, some of the previous races I'd been to, I'd seen them durometer and tires. I didn't see, I didn't see anybody uh, durometer and tires. They did race. durometer. In, I saw it. They did it in one of our races. I can't remember. Okay, yeah, they did it in medium. They just did, they just did the one right front tire, and that was it. Which yeah. okay, yeah. When you saw the the results of it, it was a little a little weird. Yeah, a little variation. A little bit. Um, Yeah, but I mean, it's, you know, it's it's a process, but, you know, this. So, again, going back, I'll take full blame for it. I'll put myself on there. I've I've said I've said stuff in a way where I'm not a huge proponent for having 206 at that level, not strictly the tire uh, like a consistently, you know, national level class, because this is supposed to be the class that, you know, uh, we go back and when someone gets into the sport, this is the motor you buy. It's not a four stroke knock or a two stroke knock. If we had a pro four stroke motor, I would say, you know, let's go all for it. But you know, you got guys like Ryan Cassidy, you got guys like Brandon and Colin who are badasses and there's not a level above it. You know, you're racing a guy that might've bought a go-kart last week. And so, you know, tired open out of the equation, engine cheating, right? It's not like that doesn't happen in an amateur class at any level, but if you're racing guys that know what they're talking about, that have been in the sport for a while, Everyone knows how to get around it, um, and that all trickles back down. And so you can't have your cake and eat it too of wanting it to be as cheap as possible, you know, as many guys as possible. Uh, you know, when you do session, 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 I mean, that's – if we ha- it would be possible that park for me without adding a lot of people if we cut a couple classes. But then you cut classes, you cut entries, that's not going to pay for the people. Um and and where would you do it? I mean, I don't know where you'd be able to do it at Newcastle. That place was packed out this weekend. You know, that would that would be tricky too. We talk about venues of uh, 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 events being able to hold the the grands. You know, I don't know one that would be able to have even a park for May Fort. But it is a cool concept that does level the playing field. Um, but you know, I think for Brandon, for Colin, for me, Braden, and Polly, right? Like we can we can go get, 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 get mad at. Scusa at the Supernats, or we can get mad at USPKS now with five hundred dollar weekend entry fees for three days plus Thursday practice. That this is an expensive event. You guys should do the Park for May stuff, but I don't want everyone to slam the CKNA guys because they give away a ton. Like the sponsorships at CKNA and all the logos around, I guarantee they're paying way less than like at a Scusa race because a lot of that money that they may be saying they're sponsoring the series they're given back to the drivers directly in contingency prizes. So it's not like that's extra money that can go into track workers or into park for May workers or into more tech guys or into, you know, a whole tire chemical testing lab to set up at the you know side of the racetrack in the tech area. So um, for everyone that's on Facebook right now or on any social media that, you know, maybe is mad at CKNA for supposedly not catching someone cheating. I mean, Paulie's a cheater. He got DQ this weekend, you know, so they're doing something. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, you just, we gotta, you know, we all as a sport need to understand that stuff costs money. People cost money, you know, Brandon costs a lot of money. Um, so if we want to have, you know, good people checking everything, doing everything, we gotta be willing to, to pay for it. It just, it won't, 
it won't happen for free, you know, because I mean, even even clubs are struggling to get get volunteers at all. It's uh, it's just what what you got to do. But um, that's at least my closing thoughts and all I want to say on the tires and and all the cheating comments. You know, Colin, if you'd like to give out your cheating secrets, you know, floor is yours. We'll wrap up the show here. What do you got? I we can't cheat. <laughs> me being involved with TS, which is the big important thing, that would be we can't even get we can't risk anything. So yeah, um, but let, let's give you guys some actual love here to sign this show off. We appreciate everyone being on. So, Colin, where are you racing next, man? Anything you want to close out with here for everyone tuning in for you? Um, I guess my next race for sure will be Super Nats, and I'm trying to make it to Miami Grands. Well, we would love to have you there, man. Ryan, what about you? Do you uh, you go back into semi-retirement? Do you got some club races, some regionals, some nationals coming up? You got uh, one more local race uh, next weekend and then uh, taking some time off till uh, maybe Charlotte. Hopefully I can make Charlotte this year. That'd be cool, man. Um, Brad, what about you? Um, Iami Grands and, uh, and Supernets. All right. So Iami Grands coming up, obviously. Pauly? What are you up to? Uh, Iami Grands, I guess. Uh, yeah, then, yeah. Uh, Super Nats. And Brandon, Iami Grands, please. We've convinced you. Please, come on. Are you doing it? <laughs> no, I can't do it. <laughs> this weekend sent me back into retirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brandon's going to the chiropractor from that. No, nah, um, you guys should have saw him after two days. He's like, oh, my ribs. What a whiny little baby. My ribs, did, my ribs did hurt pretty bad, but <clears throat> we'll be all right. <laughs> From a 206 at Newcastle. Yeah, we can't say 206. Dude, we're going physical. faster through the corner in a 206 than an X30. It's crazy. That, that's probably true, honestly. <laughs> With those tires, really? That's yeah, wild. Exactly. Yeah. Wild, it's man. It's crazy. It's all roll speed. Oh. Um, well, Hey cool stuff from this show thank you guys for being on let's give one little update here that we had before we let everybody go uh we posted on our social medias about uh the kolar family down in florida and so i wanted to put this little banner i think oh, oh we didn't have the banner set up aaron I, my, my fault i was supposed to set that up we'll send it in the comments here uh for any of you that have already taken a look this is a lo uh, look at what uh jacob kolar and jerry kolar uh and uh zanetta their uh, his mom uh, they're a small, uh, low-budget racing family, so they fit right in. Everybody that tuned into this show, they may, they drive four hours to the closest track from the bottom of Key West all the way up just to Homestead, Florida, for practice weekends, for club races. They are able to do a couple nationals a year. Uh, they got to do a few more this year, so they're a karting family through and through. I mean, they sleep in the van, drive all the way there. Hardcore racers, and unfortunately, Hurricane Ian did knock out their apartment building, uh, and they – it caught fire before they could get their uh, all their valuables out. So they got out in their pajama bottoms, and, and that was about it. Um, there's a GoFundMe that we've got posted on our page. I'll make sure that it's pinned. I'll make sure that it's added in the comments. I did want to say that I was texting uh, Jerry, Jacob's father, earlier today, and uh, he just wanted to tell everybody. He said there was too many people to thank. He's, got, he's felt the love. He wants to say thank you to every single person. As for updates, um, they're starting a, the cleanup process now. Uh, to try and see what they can get out of everything. But, you know, they, he just wanted to say to, to thanks uh, to everyone who's donated to the GoFundMe or has reached out to them. They're trying to get back to everybody that they can. But obviously Hurricane Ian was nasty down in Florida. It did hit one of our members of our carding family. So I wanted to personally say thank you to everyone that's contributed to their campaign. They're doing better. Um, if you want to still help them out, you know, they've obviously got a lot of bills coming up. They got to replace a whole lot. They got to find, make sure, make sure they're able to have a bed to sleep in until they can figure out a new living situation down there. I'm sure the keys don't have a whole lot of open vacancies after the hurricane coming through. So again, just, uh, you know, from, from them, they're doing all right. They're, they're, uh, they're making it. Um, but, uh, you know, they wanted to make sure that they, uh, said, as Jerry said to me, we lost everything, but we found out the world is not lost and not as bad. Uh, cause we've got some amazing friends and family out there. So, uh, awesome, awesome stuff from our carding family for stepping up. I think their original goal to help these guys out was like $5,000 and we've blown past that. It's sitting at about 24 K. So that's a great little nest egg. And I'd love to see that get a little bigger to help these people out in a, a time of need. So if you haven't ch uh, chimed into that, I'll make sure that we put it in the comments here below, uh, and as well, put that on our page, but for everybody joining us here, guys, good show. We navigated it. Didn't get canceled. Another week goes by. Haven't caught Collins cheating yet. No matter. He says he's not cause he's too fast to not be cheating. But, um, anyway, 
Uh, thank you guys for coming on here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll let everybody go. We will see you guys uh, next week, next Tuesday. We wrap up all the major events that happened this week and prep for IAMI Grand Nationals uh, edition number two. We'll see you guys down the road.